to today's Euractive event, Shaping the Agriculture of Tomorrow, How Can Farmers and Consumers Benefit from a Reformed CAP, Common Agricultural Policy. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based in Brussels, and I'm coming at you live from the Euractive studios in the heart of the EU quarter. Now, as I'm sure most of the audience members are aware, we are currently in a period of reform of the EU's common agricultural policy that's updated every seven years for the new seven-year budget period. But this time, things are a bit different. The revision is coming as the agricultural sector is dealing with unprecedented challenges due to the COVID-19 crisis. The challenges are myriad logistical issues, a workforce shortage, and radical changes in demand, just to name a few. Luckily, the impact of the crisis on food markets has remained relatively limited thanks to the resilience of the food chain. Now, according to the EU's Agricultural Outlook for 2020 to 2030, published in December, the crisis has led to the reinforcement of some pre-existing trends, with an increase in demand for locally produced food, short supply chains, and e-commerce sales. Furthermore, the report found that health concerns about origin and environment and climate change are among the key drivers of consumer choices. Of course, COVID isn't the only crisis that's been factored into this reform. The climate crisis has also been factored in. New sustainability requirements are being prepared. The Commission's proposals for the future of the CAP aim to make the EU's agricultural policy more responsive to current and future challenges, while continuing to support the needs of European farmers, who have experienced a double challenge to produce food while simultaneously protecting nature and safeguarding biodiversity. So today we're going to talk about the future of agriculture at this pivotal moment and how the CAP reform will affect European farmers and consumers. So let me introduce to you now our panelists. Uh, we have with us today Hus Schiltus, Head of Unit for Policy Perspective at the European Commission's Agriculture Department. We have Herbert Dorfman, Italian center-right MEP and a member of the European Parliament's Agriculture Committee. We have Thomas Waits, Austrian Green MEP and a substitute on the European Parliament's Agriculture Committee. We have Yves Madre, co-founder of the think tank Farm Europe. We have Agnieszka Malazuska, first vice president of COGECA, which represents agricultural cooperatives, and Eric Mathius, professor of agricultural economics at KU Leuven. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for being with us here today. Now, you guys at home are also going to be part of the conversation. You'll have the chance to ask your questions to the panelists using the Q&A feature in Vimeo. I'm going to go ahead and start that Q&A now. So any moment from now, you can type in your questions to the panelists, and I'll be reading those out to the panelists toward the end of the discussion. So let's get started. Hus, I want to start with you, uh, because obviously the, the genesis of any cap reform comes from the Commission. So what are the main highlights of what is expected to change with this particular CAP reform? Uh, you are on mute, I think. See, still on mute. Let's go to Herbert Dorfman while we're waiting for uh, the mic problems to be sorted out there. So, Herbert, let's uh, go to you. From the European Parliament's perspective, what have MEPs been pushing to include in this reform? Well, we try to have a real reform uh, here in the European Parliament. That a real reform means for me that we need to come to a sustainable agriculture, but sustainable for me means sustainable in ecologic terms. And we were in favor of a 30% uh, share on the first pillar for eco schemes. But uh, sustainability means also that the farm needs to be uh, needs to be economically su sustainable. So the common agricultural policy needs to remain also an economic policy in favor of the farmers which we who really work on the farm. And I personally think today we have too many 
people who get uh, subsidies from the uh, from the cap without being really involved full time or at least the part time but at least part time in farming they uh, simply have entitlements and we have to concentrate the money on uh, on on people and families which are really farming and we need a social element and we try to introduce a social dimension in 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 the in this policy this was our aim uh, unfortunately as you know, as you know last week uh, we failed uh, to get an agreement on this because the member states uh, uh, especially on the on the ecological sustainability um, there was no support from the member states uh, at the end they wanted a share in eco schemes of 18 percent and not 30 and this is for the parliament was not acceptable Thanks, Herbert. Uh, let's, we have, okay, Hughes, I think we're going to try you again. Go ahead Excellent. and talk. We'll make, Can you hear me now? Great. Yes, there you are. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Good morning, uh, fellow panelists. That's how I started. I was going to say, but Mr. Dorfman already, of course, uh, highlighted this. We, I thought I would be in a different position here uh, speaking, but um, uh, we're now still in a, in a, in a, in a phase of negotiation. Uh, what are the key things that we're expecting out of this? I think the, the, the main thing is that we will allocate more funds to uh support farmers in the traditional in the transition to sustainable farming the which is the great challenge of uh, of today uh linked to climate change and the environment so that means that we expect yeah, a, a larger uh share of money for eco schemes so the section of first pillar direct support to farmers dedicated to the environment but also uh, a stronger role for agri-environment measures in the second pillar and i i would also like to highlight that what we uh, aim to get out of this reform also is a, a stronger focus on knowledge and innovation, farm advice. And we have to um, help farmers to innovate, uh, innovate in a competitive way. Um, we want to reinforce what we call the European Innovation Partnership. Uh, we have already, through the Horizon program, allocated more money to uh, agricultural and environmental research as a uh, as EU. So that is also a major component of the, the sustainability uh, uh, angle. The second point is uh, fairness. Uh, we are focusing on redistributing um, funds. Uh, you all know the debate about capping funds to those who receive most direct payments. That's one side of the coin. The Commission really hopes that member states in their future strategic plans under the Common Agricultural Policy will use that tool to cap payments to those who receive most, but also we uh, hope that the reform will lead to uh, more redistribution uh, uh, to uh, the ones who receive uh, who receive less. And another aspect of this agenda of fairness is also the discussion on the social conditionality, linking payments to respect for workers' rights. And we we uh, uh, we, are, we have very good hopes that that will be an important part of the of, of the package uh, uh, as well that is being negotiated. I think it's also important to highlight position of farmers in the food chain uh, uh, under the leadership um, of uh, of the parliament. In this case, a number of of uh, issues have been put on the table to uh, reinforce the position of farmers in the food chain, and um, uh, it's important. For example, uh, farmers producing uh, geographical uh, products designated with geographical indications that those farmers can have more power to to uh, to shape the market. I think it's important that those reforms are also uh, also form part of the uh, of the package. And then uh, maybe a final point is uh, the new way of working. Uh, we now have a, a CAP that is uh, 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 consists of different parts: a first pillar, a second pillar, sectoral schemes, uh, and uh, the Commission has proposed. The new way of working with strategic plans, bringing a lot of the support schemes together, making sure they pull in the same direction, uh, trying to build synergies and that new way of working, focusing also on the performance of the policy, not so much on the compliance with the rules. We also believe that that is going to be a very important outcome uh, of this reform. And, and we are also uh, happy that both uh, parts of the legislature support that, uh, that, that angle. So four points, but I'm sure we'll be able to discuss more on, on all of these uh, during the, the next hour or so. Thank you.
Yeah, and we'll talk more about that switch from a compliance system to a performance-based system during the discussion. Uh, Thomas, let's turn to you next. I mentioned in my introduction, obviously, the climate concerns that are inherent in this cap reform. Um, do you think that the European Parliament's CAP text has properly taken into account the role of climate neutrality, uh, particularly in light of the COVID crisis and the need to recover? I believe that even the text uh, that the Parliament has found a majority for uh, is not actually using all the opportunities that agriculture would have to contribute to, to the solution of uh, solving the climate crisis but while going uh, climate neutral. Uh, by replacing artificial fertilizers, we could not just spare emissions, but actually really sequest uh, CO2 into the soil while using green fertilizer. And also in terms of uh, serving the rural areas, serving the recovery, um, especially the negotiations that we've seen now uh, based on, on the text that the Parliament and the Commission actually proposed uh, are not going in the direction of saving jobs in the rural areas. We see it in the discussion around capping, while the parliament proposed 100,000 euros bottom uh, and or top level, uh, but not even the so-called Holmeyer proposal of 500,000 euros maximum per holding seems to have a chance to actually get a positive decision at the end of the day. And that will uh, drive even more the intensification, industrialization, uh, and the, um, the um, grab on bigger landscapes of the very few holdings. And as we see, Copacojeca uh, was uh, negotiating with a very clear standpoint where they said, well, as little echo as possible, as little paperwork as possible, and the cap shall basically pay the farmers what they are already doing. And I don't want to say that parts of the agricultural sector are already contributing to positive impacts on environment, but the large chunk of agriculture is not. And there we see clearly that the that there's a capture of, of, uh, of, uh, of the position by the interests of the very few and big farmers, and that's going to drive to even less farmers in, on the ground. And we have to clearly state more ecological means more workforce per hectare, and we will need the farmers on the land that actually run a diverse agriculture with a diverse landscape. Uh, and there uh, I see not much hope that we're getting uh, the, the recovery idea on on, first of all, green jobs, second of all, solving the climate crisis and using taxpayers' money for exactly that, that we get that right. And just the last word on the eco schemes. We're debating 20, 25 or 30 percent. But if we look into the concrete proposals, let me just take the crop rotation. Well, the parliament already had, I would say, for my regards, a weak position on the two-year crop rotation. But actually, the council came up with the idea, well, how do we have a one-year crop rotation if I plant a second plant in one year? which is completely awkward. They have obviously not understood the concept of crop rotation. So even the eco schemes that we may get uh, will not serve the purpose, are so watered down, are so vague. A lot of them are actually voluntarily, not mandatory. So to my regards, we're not on a good path at all. Let's turn to Eve from uh, Farm Europe next. Eve, what has been the effect of the COVID-19 crisis on farmers and how can this CAP reform help? Good morning, everyone. Uh, indeed, we all have in mind the dramatic impact of the COVID crisis uh, on, for, for instance, flora, on uh, on the monetary plant sector, on all, all the sectors dependent upon restoration, and notably the wine sector, for instance. But the, the fact is, and what I would like to underline today is that I think that the, the crisis uh, is not over. And I'm afraid uh, that the impact on the economy has been mainly delayed. Uh, studies have helped, but the fear of inflation or recession is real. And recession means, and will mean, uh, for sure, reduction of demand uh, for agricultural products and a shift of demand to cheaper products as well. Uh, and when it comes to uh, exports, uh, they will also suffer if the, the crisis uh, is worldwide, of course. So I think that today, focusing on recovery and resilience is indeed of utmost importance. And to prepare the future, we need a robust CEP focusing on double performance. Uh, in order to, to get so, I think that we need 
uh, sort of invest, innovative investments in forms aiming at increasing both profitability and sustainability all together, not one without the other, not the other without the first one. And we need, of course, a CEP well equipped to tackle risks and crises. And to make things uh, very clear, uh, the crisis, this crisis has shown that the existing toolbox of market measures is not sufficiently equipped. And, and we have as well a thing to recognize that uh, when it comes to a European-wide market crisis, we can only tackle it by common measure. So we need to learn from the experience of the past and be it the two dairy prices or the fruit and vegetables one, it is clear that intervening when the crisis is fully developed costs more and causes more economic pain uh, and social pain uh, uh, as well. So we have the risk management tools defined in 2013, indeed refined during the financial reality uh, omnibus, but they are not equipped to face such a crisis. They provide answers to market volatility but not to deep crisis. So it's crucial that the European Union moves to create a real crisis reserve with the appropriate rules of engagement. The European Parliament has proposed it with more than 40, uh, 400 million, um, for sure. We need to have rules of engagement that allow the Commission to intervene quickly to address the market and to use the best means available, for instance, uh, in order to reduce the supply, for, to compensate farmers, uh, for output losses, for, for instance, and to do it very quickly, not month after. And so I think that to, to summarize, uh, all in all, the new CEP indeed is still to be finalized. It was not foreseen as such today, uh, uh, but, Let's be clear, uh, negotiator, it means that negotiators have still some weeks to refine the reform, meaning to define a reform with a common European ambition, rules and requirements, a reform with effective means to achieve the ecological transition of the European agri-food systems, a reform which focuses on environmental, economic, and social performance all together, and sorry to underline it again, but the world all together is so important, and a reform having food security, I think, for all as a true goal, and refusing any dual nutrition in the European Union, depending on your level of income. And the fact is, the CAP, we have to finalize it. But let's be clear, it will just be the beginning. National strategic plan will have to be defined, and then we have to be efficient. And the far to focus on biodiversity strategies with their 48 plan initiatives, we have to be coherent with the aims I've just mentioned. Not going the opposite, it could be a fear. Not pushing the European Union on the path of deep growth, which would result in more imports, which would be something strange indeed, and which will result in the impoverishment of Europe. So we have work ahead, not only with CIP, we have some days, weeks to solve the problem. We'll discuss about them just in a few, few minutes, I, I think. But just have in mind that it's not only about CIP, it's all about all the European Union wants to tackle all the problems of economy, of sustainability, of nutrition, of food. Agnieszka, let's turn to you next. What are you watching most closely in this CAP reform? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, no, no, the question is not quite, uh, it's, it's not uh, it's not easy, but the answer will be not simple at all. First of all, I think uh, uh, we must understand that cooperatives is a type of organization for farmers. 
At the moment, uh, in the Europe, we have 22,000 uh, cooperatives, uh, dominated obviously dairy and uh, uh, dairy cooperatives and uh, food and vegetable. The most important agricultural cooperatives key task is improving farmers' position uh, in the food production chain and uh, collectively issues uh, long-term competitors in the market. This is a very important and this is the key task. Uh, for the last week, uh, all mm, farmers and all cooperatives was focused on, on the Brussels because we are watching to uh, finish this, negoci this negotiation and we are watching to success and uh, uh, full negotiation for agriculture uh, sector. This is important for agricultural cooperatives and for millions of farmers in the European Union. What is important for us? <clears throat> because the, for the last uh, six year, years, uh, the CIP, uh, CIP uh, was um, the type of the uh, foundation that it was uh, the link uh, with stability of agricultural production and uh, it has uh, linked to the European project and agriculture too. Uh, it has given to stability for farmers and it was, it was very, very important and is very important for us. Uh, it has guarantee uh, for uh, agriculture sector and finally for consumer that we will continue to have a good quality and safe food and European uh, for the European citizens' uh, table. Uh, this is a fundamental, absolutely. We must remember that European cooperatives and European far farmers uh, close the cooperation all day. And this cooperation among farmers in a key for meeting that CIP uh, uh, reform obviously stated in the uh, article 39 treaty of uh, functioning of the european union but also we met the uh, environment and the climate ambition we respect this and we know this is not uh, this is important absolutely but now the whole responsibility in a uh, is on uh, farmers and agri crops shoulders. If we need to farmers welcome uh, innovation, um, green, uh, making uh, the green farms and the most eco farms and um, sustainability agriculture, uh, we must support them uh, financially. Uh, if we want to the CIP reform to be a success, we must remember that this success is closely connected with financial support we should give them. And this is, uh, this is the most important, this is, this, uh, this is the, the message for day and believe me, day by day, farmers and uh, cooperatives, hard working for, for, for the, uh, the climate, uh, for the change, uh, and uh, for to be a more green and more to eco. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So let's turn to Eric for an academic perspective. Eric, you've been watching this whole CAP reform process play out. What's your assessment of this particular CAP reform? Thank you, David, and uh, good morning. Uh, well, like every CAP reform, the new CAP is going in the right direction. But the question is, of course, as was raised uh, already, are sufficient resources being greened uh, and has it been done uh, fast enough? Are our standards raised uh, fast enough? Now, the, probably not, but the point that I would like to make is, it's well, it's not only about money. It's not about, only about resource uh, redistribution. I think an important problem of the new cap or a lost opportunity, if you like, and the same holds for the farm uh, to fork strategy, is it's, it is still not systemic. It's not still not taking a food systems approach. Let me give you an example. The cap forces standards on farmers uh, or, or, or may for, uh, I mean, depending on, on the outcome of the, of the, of the, of the talks, uh, but it does so without forcing the rest of the food system to help farmers in dealing with those standards. Now, if I if I take 
the example of crop rotation, which was uh, mentioned earlier, of course, more crop rotation is good. It's good for, for, for the soil. It's good for um, environmental outcomes. Uh, but processors and, and retailers buying uh, uh, products from farmers are not forced to buy up a crop mix. There is no contracts for uh, rotations. It's it's only for commodities. And so you're forcing one part of the system to do something, but the rest of the system, um, uh, you're not forcing on the rest of the system to actually enable those farmers to, to, to handle that. Uh, and another issue is, of course, uh, trade policy, which was also mentioned a little bit. Um, raising standards without changing trade policy, you know, may open up the door for more import. Although, if you look at uh, there was a study by the USDA uh, uh, in November simulating the the impact of uh, of the farm to fork strategy, and, and in which imports only in, increased by two percent, so so we we may not have too much problem uh, with that. But of course, exports in that same simulation uh, decreased with twenty percent, and so there is the, this trade issue as well. Uh, but to wrap up, I understand the reluctance for, for more greening from the farming community. But of course, reaching environmental objectives also depends on the credibility of the environmental policies that are there. The Nitro Directive, the climate law, which is coming up. So farmers can, um, can change their practices. They should even uh, uh, change their practices, uh, even without eco schemes. I think uh, the climate crisis is... is uh, is pressuring enough, and I hope that you know the other. The I mean, again, it depends on the credibility of the implementation of the um, uh, of these other uh, uh, policies in the mix, the environmental policies, uh, to reach our goals. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We've got a couple of questions for the panelists, but of course, you guys at home can ask your questions as well. Just do so on the Vimeo uh, feature there and type in your question, and I'll read it out to the panelists. Um, Herbert, I wanted to come back to you because we heard from Hus about the uh, well, the negotiations happening right now, uh, and that they well, there, there's been less progress, I think, than hoped. So, what are the main outstanding issues that still need to be sorted out in the negotiations? What are the big sticking points here? Well, I personally think last week the most important sticking points were the engagement uh, on the eco schemes. So there's a completely different opinion in the, between the parliament and, and the council, as I said before. Um, on redistribution, we got uh, more or less, we came to an agreement, but we will not accept in the parliament that uh, member states can opt out uh, from uh, from uh, our redistribution, because if we concede an opt out system, uh, fundamentally it's up to the member states if they want to do a redistribution or not. And I think it is really, uh, uh, really important that we have uh, an obligatory redistribution system from the biggest farms to the smaller farms to the family farms of at least 10 percent of uh, of the resources and then we um, need to get come to an agreement about um, internal conversions also there i'm very surprised about the member states uh, um, i mean uh, we are we have member states um, which are still calculating uh, the value of the entitlements in the first pillar partly on the on on the production or on what happened in the farm 21 years ago in the year 2000 and this is completely unacceptable and the member states now want on one side to have to, to limit the, the internal uh, conversion at 85 percent but at the same time they want to um, uh, to have a safeguard clause that no nobody no entitlement should lose more than 30 percent of its value and they make you an example from my own member state from italy we have entitlements in italy which are worth more than 10,000 euros for one hectare and why should i say or give to this to the owner of this entitlement the opportunity to say no no now forever or for, or for for other uh, seven years, we safeguard this situation. You will not lose more than 3,000 euros. You will get on 
to, uh, to go on to get 7,000 euros per hectare, where you have maybe mice or permanent grassland or pasture, is com a completely nonsense. And uh, here you see that the member states very often, they are uh, trying to preserve com completely absurd situations and, and, and they are not willing to, um, to go to, their, to the farmers, not only to the farmers, to the people who benefit from this policy and say, no, now it's finished, it's, the policy changed and we need to have new rules. And this is what I'm expecting. I think we are in a reform process and the reform means that something will change. And um, the approach of some member states to say, yes, we make the best reform is a reform where, not, where nothing will change at the end. This is not acceptable. And this was at the end, I think, the biggest problem last last week and uh, and on this the parliament will will insist and, and we'll try to, we will go on to 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 fight to have a fair distribution of money and supporting mainly who is really farming and who is really bringing innovation on 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 the farms the young people uh, the families um, i think this is important not to uh, guarantee of poor uh, uh, guarantee uh, uh, values for poor landowners and people who bought a lot of land in the last years only to get the benefit from their investment. This is not the sense of a policy and it's not up to the tax, European taxpayer to finance this. Chris, let me get your response to that. I mean, in Trilogues, the Commission is kind of in between the Council and the Parliament, so the Commission is watching these negotiations go forward. Do you agree with Herbert's assessment of where the negotiations are? Um, yeah, I think uh, Mr. Dorfman made, uh, made a number of points that are indeed uh, on, the, on the table. Um, I, I think uh, the Commission is trying constantly to, to put... Uh, uh, solutions uh, on the table that uh, that try to uh, find uh, by which we're trying to find a compromise between the the, the different parties. Uh, so I, I think indeed uh, there has been a lot of talk about the um, uh, the, the, the on the green aspects uh, on uh, on uh, eco eco schemes and on on the numbers in that regard. Uh, uh, that's that's where a compromise uh, needs to be found. I think on uh, indeed on the issue of uh, redistribution and fairness. I think. Um, there are uh, some big steps were already uh, were already taken. Uh, 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 Mr. Dorfman uh, highlighted the issue of uh, internal uh, internal convergence, which is the sort of technical term we call it for 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 trying to uh, phase out the historical levels of of payment and to come to payments that better reflect uh, the situation of today and the challenges of particular areas. Um, and uh, that is something that the Commission has been pursuing, yeah? but uh, we're trying to also find a compromise with uh, with with the views that uh, that are out there. Um, so these are these are a couple of the uh, of of the points that are that are on the table. But I think if you look at the negotiations that have been taking place so far, I think a lot has been achieved last week. I think we should not underestimate how much. Um, how many uh, smaller and bigger points were on the table and where solutions were found. And I think now is also the time that we let the chief uh, negotiators and the teams um, uh, try to find the, the, the middle ground. Uh, if I don't know exactly what the timing is that the parliament and the Portuguese presidency of the council have in mind, but um, uh, 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 since the, the Portuguese presidency lasted the end of June, I, I, I think we, we really hope that that before the end of this month, uh, a conclusion uh, can be found. And I, I think this is entirely possible and the Commission will uh, do its best to, uh, to facilitate uh, uh, such an agreement. Thanks. Well, you mentioned some of the green aspects that are still being discussed. Eve, do you think that these green aspects are one of the things holding up agreement here? Yes, uh, I don't think so. But maybe to understand uh, what happened la la last week, uh, it's necessary to, to go back to the, the sources of the initial proposal. Uh, in, in this proposal, uh, there are a number of strengths, but also weaknesses. And that explains, I think, a large part of the breakages and difficulties to, today. Uh, just to have in mind, the key parameters of the green architecture were quite a blank page in the, the initial proposal. 
so now it's up to the co-legislator to rebuild the basis on environmental base of the CAP, notably uh, with the GAIC, Good Agri Environmental Practices Report for Farmers, and to give consistency to the eco schemes we, uh, which were already mentioned and uh, which were initially an, uh, quite a, an empty box. So I think that now the negotiation revolves around a very limited number of points that embody how to shape the Green Deal. Uh, gate 8, rotation, and gate 9, the port of uh, non productive uh, arable lands. Uh, which uh, would be in each member state or on each farm, the means allocated to eco scheme, the capacity to invest in economic and ecological transition through such a marking of the second pillar, and uh, guarantees regarding the proper respect of social rights. And as well, of course, as I mentioned previously, the means allocated to risk and crisis management. And when it comes to internal convention, uh, convergence mentioned by Herbert and Gilles, uh, I think that we should have in mind to ask what is feasible for member states. Uh, we, we are on negotiators, we have to, to look at the cumulative impact of budget cuts and financial relocations associated with the, the, the new CAP. Uh, so now I think that it's time for a balanced and strong solution, not for any play game, game, and to focus on the, just this limited number of points in order to solve them. It's not so difficult, I think. Uh, there is it's a main matter of will. Uh, of will of the three institutions all together, uh, but uh, let's be confident. Yetska, I wonder if I could get you to respond to some of the points that Eve has just made and also the points made by Eric earlier. Um, from a farmer's perspective, from the farming community's perspective, what are the aspects of the greening requirements that are complicated or, or might prove difficult? So thank you for the question. <laughs> Yeah, when I see uh, and uh, listen information about this negotiation, and the most important uh, key is uh, eco scheme, and uh, the eco scheme is obviously very important. But this type of uh, and uh, this number of percentage is absolutely not acceptable uh, about uh, for us, for example. But we need to remember uh, in the Europe we have different cooperatives and different farmers to the small, uh, middle and uh, uh, the big. And the role of the, the, we, uh, we, uh, we should provide food for the, uh, for the people, European people, citizens and so on. And uh, the last time uh, the crisis, uh, coronavirus time, uh, show uh, for us, what important is uh, uh, is uh, the role of uh, and uh, task um, farmers and agricultural cooperatives, and I think uh, we did well this. Uh, there was um, all the European uh, uh, table. We have the food, and uh, it was a great test and uh, and challenge for. Uh, every uh, agriculture sector and for farming, uh, for farmers and for uh, cooperatives, to, uh, cooperatives too. And I think everybody passed, uh, passed this uh, test uh, with flyer uh, colors. And the same, uh, I think, we uh, looking for and we were we waiting for um, councils, for, for council, for parliaments, and for um, European Commission too. Thank you. Um, when we're talking about resilience, I mean, what's your take on this, this resilience issue? Uh, Eric, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry, I, I missed you uh, yeah. your first word, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dave. Well, resilient. I think indeed that um, uh, the food system and the farming system 
has has uh, have shown uh, an extraordinary resilience to uh, uh, to the to the, the COVID nineteen crisis. But but I would like to point out that uh, resilience is not only about robustness, um, and and of course a large part of the common agricultural policy is indeed still direct payments, which helps farmers to be robust because it's a buffer. It's a financial buffer for all kinds of um, shocks and stresses that uh, that uh, work upon them. But it's also very important uh, for farmers and for the food system to be adaptable, to adapt to change, because uh, uh, because systems probably will no longer be fit to deal with uh, issues like, of course, the climate crisis. So farmers need to adapt, and they need to. Uh, to be assisted in that adaptation. So adaptability or even transformability are also part of resilience. And we see in the common agricultural policy that these funds are more located in the in the second pillar, uh, whereas most of the funds are still allocated to you know making them robust. And that's of course always a big uh, challenge for any policymaker for for every also for farmers. How should I strike a balance between uh, consolidating in the status quo? And on the one hand, uh, investing into innovation and in, in, uh, in new business models. But I think that, that, that the latter is, is, is definitely uh, becoming more and more important. So Herbert, I think you have to leave shortly. So I just wonder if you want to respond to any of the comments made so far before you have to head out. And um, no, I, 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 I agree. I think we need the uh, a policy which is on which is on one side supporting the the market, but we need also. Uh, I want to respond to what if Mother said at the beginning. I think we need also to decide if we want a policy which goes on on the path of the last year, so wants to come back to a market oriented policy. And I I'm aware that we have we might have crisis situations in Europe. Uh, where we need to intervene. But on the other side, we need also be, to be aware that we are on a free market and uh, we need to find a balance in this. I think we cannot come back to, our, to a common agricultural policy, which is mainly an intervention policy. At least I'm not in favor of this. I think we need to support the farmers who are working. We need to support farmers who are working in a more difficult situations situation, but going to a uh, a much more market-oriented policy. This does not help uh, people, farmers who are in complicated situations. This helps fundamentally who is producing a lot and uh, and and at a low price and get the guarantee for a low price. And this, I think, is not the right uh, approach. Um, so we need to we need to find a balance between these things: the economic the economic uh, dimension, the social dimension, and also the ecological dimension. And uh, and this, I think, is is the most most important uh, thing on this. And we need on this and on this, I very much agree with Eric. We need to, and then myself, uh, the rapporteur and the farm to fork strategy. We need to come to a more um, systemic approach in the in the food chain. Uh, where the burdens and the obligations are not only on the farmer side, but we need to understand that this is all uh, that the farmers at the end they produce for the consumers, and the consumers uh, can influence a lot what is happening on the farms if they are not only uh, criticizing the farmers and if they are not only telling the farmers what the farmers should do, but if they go to the supermarket or to wherever and they and buy high, high quality and high value food and and, and this the farmers uh, the consumers i think need to need to understand so we need to we need to bring the consumers on our side and they had a bit the impression and they have the impression that in the, in the last years we had more and more uh, the, 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 the farmers on one side the industry in the middle and the consumers they did not they they went far and far away and not didn't come closer, and and this we need to come back to a, to a to a situation where or to to, to a policy where the, the 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 consumers understand what the farmers are doing and the farmers understand the consumers need and I think this is one of the challenges of the 
of the of the um, of after fault strategy. With this, unfortunately, yes, I need to leave because I have an important appointment in some minutes. Thank you very much, and sorry for this. No worries. Thanks for being with us, Herbert. Thomas, I wanted to ask you about, you know, we've been talking about the green aspects of this CAP reform, uh, but also, obviously, this is all taking place in the context of the EU Green Deal. So how compatible do you think this CAP is looking with the EU Green Deal? Is, is the end product here going to be something that is in line with that overarching EU policy? Thank you, Dave, for that question. By the way, my video is stable, so you could bring me into the screen. But no matter, uh, I, I hope you can hear me well, at least. Well, first of all, uh, I, I want to contradict what Agnieszka was saying earlier. Eco schemes are not endangering the food production to serve European citizens with food. Uh, European Union is the biggest agri-exporter of the world, first of all. And second of all, eco schemes are guaranteeing a long-term mid and long-term ability of the agriculture to deliver a food production even in difficult climate circumstances. Eco schemes are there to prevent erosion, to prevent saltification, uh, to prevent actually the loss of land uh, and the loss of fertility and rich lands, uh, to secure also uh, a stable food production for our citizens in the mid and long term. And yes, the short term yields would go back a little bit. And then the question on does it contribute to the Green Deal? Well, we the whole economy, the whole industry, the transport sector, our households, you know, our citizens, every part of society will have to contribute to CO2 neutrality. And that means changing habits, changing way of how we move forward, yeah? changing way how we produce steel. Uh, and we also need to pick that kind of transition up in the agricultural sector, especially as the agricultural sector is the only one, to my regard, except of some not well-functioning technical solutions, to re-sequest CO2 into the soil. And farmers know how to do that. They exactly know how to do that. And we had the argument on, well, the market is demanding, well, the most profitable crop every year. It may be so now, but we see also bioeconomy developing very fast. And if we want to leave oil and gas in the soil, we will need to replace these CO2 chains in the production of plastics, uh, in the production of cosmetics, of, you know, wherever we use oil today in industry to produce industrial products, we will need to replace them. And so there will be a demand, a growing demand for agricultural products also for these kind of uses. Uh, also, the argument that we have to co-develop the different parts of the market are rightly done so, because uh, it's clear that we have to ensure that farmers are get paid for their extra work we're demanding from them. And it's extra work to use green fertilizer instead of artificial fertilizer. So we need to ensure fair production prices, uh, which we can actually uh, co-ensure with creating the right demand. Only if I look at the public procurement system across Europe, what market share that has across Europe through uh, changing our uh, demand from the public procurement towards ecologically produced uh, agriculture cultural goods could be organic or agroecologically uh, produced goods, we could help the market a lot. And somebody also mentioned trade. And one thing is clear, what we cannot do is raise the standards for European production, limit the pesticides that are used in Europe, uh, putting extra work on the farmers daily uh, practice on the fields and through this raising the production costs and then trying to match that one-to-one -to, -one to a free global market where we compete with low-income uh, uh, workers in Brazil and low uh, and environmental uh, um, laws wherever in the world and then we import that without actually these products meeting our European standards. So that's key. If we want to go up with the quality and ecological quality of our production, we also need to demand that kind of level from imported products or put tolls on them to balance actually on the market. That's a key point. And I mean, so to say something positive also about the proposal on the, play, on, on the table now is that 
four uh, percent of the CAP to go to young farmers. That's also that's positive and key policy to keep actually farmers on the ground to have new generations taking over to motivate new generations. I would say that's a positive outcome. But in terms of really contributing to the Green Deal or even to the biodiversity and farm to fork strategy, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you have seen the reluctance of the governments to even include the mentioning of both of these strategies into the cap text with the argument, well, that's not a legal uh, uh, requirement yet. Uh, there you see that, that there's the will to really contribute from the agricultural sector to our common effort to become CO2 neutral is really in many places and in many governments, national governments, it's really not there. And I find it completely irresponsible towards our next generations, but also towards the farming sector, which is the ones that face the impact of climate change and of, of climate crisis in their daily work. That's the one that face it most. So it's also irresponsible towards the farming sector to still fund uh, uh, an ecological destruction uh, uh, and, uh, of soil, of biodiversity, with taxpayers' money actively going on funding it. If you ask me, something like crop rotation should be mandatory for every single farm holding that runs a field and that wants public money for that. Hus, let me get you to respond to that. Do you think that we're going to end up with something that's compatible with the Green Deal? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and, and I'd like to pick up on Thomas Waits' enthusiasm to, uh, to describe the, uh, the, the change towards a more sustainability, sustainable society as, a, as really as a growth, uh, a growth strategy, as, 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 a, as, a, uh, as full of opportunity. And so I, I think it was already mentioned also by Eric Matthijs and by Yves Madre earlier, eh? we need to uh, approach the food system holistically. Eh? We need to look at environmental, social, economic aspects all together. Eh? And that is exactly what we're, uh, what we're trying to do. First in the cap reform, eh? where, we, where we really have all three elements uh, clearly uh, set out. Uh, and we are trying to bring uh, agriculture uh, 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 to trying to see agriculture as part of the, of, the, of the European food system in the farm to fork strategy, which is our food and agriculture component of the of, of the Green Deal. Uh, so we are um, really trying to uh, not only look at agriculture and the CAP, which we are discussing this morning, but also to look at all the other uh, aspects of the food chain and take measures there. Uh, Yves Madre has cited all the other measures uh, that the Commission has in mind and that the Commission is preparing. Um, uh, uh, with regard to the food system, and he, he's absolutely right. Eh? It's not just this cap reform, it's a broader package, and uh, we are uh, very much committed to, uh, 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 to making sure that this broader package brings the food system to a, a completely different level of, of, uh, of sustainability, but also uh, including this, this, this element of economic opportunity. And I think what is really important, it's to, when uh, we started this discussion looking at uh, eco schemes and our, uh, is it is it compatible with the green deal um, i think what we have to uh, look at is also this new way of working in the cap which we have proposed as commission and um, yeah, on the one hand there, there is a, a, a european legislation with the sort of the the, the minimum um, that all member states have to comply with but the whole idea of this new way of working is that it will be based on strategic plans of member states based on a needs assessment based on a swap analysis technical terms for looking at my figures looking at the situation on the ground looking at what is the real problem in my region in my country and how can i best address this and which measures of the cap should i um, uh, put together and how should i design them to best address this and so rather than to only discuss the, 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 the lowest common denominator at EU level, we really think that these strategic plans will allow member states to develop uh, uh, policies that go into, um, I, I, into a direction of, of, of growing sustainability. This is not just, uh, this whole process is not just for the next couple of years under this CAP, it's a longer term trend. Uh, uh, Thomas Waits uh, mentioned the, the, the climate neutrality objective of, of 2050 and, of course, the climate uh, uh, goals for 2030. Uh, we are really setting a long-term uh, horizon for where we want to go in terms of sustainability, and the CAP 
is a very important instrument to, to uh, contribute to that through this new way of working, through these strategic plans, yeah, and through the measures that we need to put in place to help farmers uh, uh, make this transition and to compensate for costs that are not uh, uh, paid for uh, by, uh, by, by consumers, yeah, that are not covered in the price of a product. So I think we are on a track to, um, to, uh, uh, to make sure that the cap reform is really uh, uh, going to contribute to this uh, Green Deal. Thanks. Eve, do you think that we are on our way to a CAP that's compatible with the Green Deal? It could be. Uh, and, uh, I hope so. Uh, because I think that now the question is uh, it's a question of shaping the Green Deal into concrete action and not anymore into incantations. Uh, so we have to translate objective into concrete of and uh, we have to, to be very careful uh, not to place member states uh, in a situation with unrealistic objectives uh, on the, that would lock the, the CAP into a dead hand, uh, I think. So eco schemes can be useful and will be useful if they are well defined, uh, not only at member states level, but first at European level. On top of, but it won't alone, it won't be uh, such a thing, and we need as well uh, investments on uh, focus on innovative investment in farm and uh, crisis toolkits, I think. And all in all, I think maybe the problem is not the objective. The problem is the way we will want to implement things. Do we go first for constraints, taxes, or for incentives? And it depends on the way you, 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 you choose. Uh, uh, yeah, Hayes mentioned the farm to fork uh, on biodiversity strategies. Indeed, right now, the proposal of the Commission, the way they propose to implement things, we'll see what the co-legislators will de 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 decide. But the proposal of the, uh, of the Commission will result in, according to USA and Eric mentioned it, uh, minus 10% of European agricultural production. We did our own studies, it's not so far, it's on average minus 10, and depending on sectors it could be worse or a little better. But, uh, and of course, at the end of the, of the day, a decrease of European exports, but there is a matter of food security, not only for Europe, but worldwide as a, uh, as a rule, and Europe uh, has to, to play sport. Uh, uh, we have some responsibility, and there would be as well an increase of protein imports. This is not the right way. We can indeed, I think, uh, agree on uh, uh, the objective where we have to go to go what we have to achieve there is no discussion on that but please we have to work very very uh, deeply on how to reach this objective how to implement things because on one way it would be either double performance dynamics growth for, for Europe and more sustainability more environment or the growth on, I don't know where we would be uh, if, we, if we go on this path. Well, let's take some questions from the audience. The first question comes from Konstantin Golembek. It's a, Tom, it's a question for you, Thomas. Uh, Thomas, you mentioned green fertilizers. What exactly are they and how could they be provided sufficiently? Well, um, green fertilizer, I mean, English is not my native language, so excuse me if I use the wrong terms, but it's basically 
planting plants on a field that are collecting with photosynthesis. So with some power, they're collecting CO2 from the atmosphere, growing plant material out of that, which is then worked into the top level of the soil, which is creating humus and humus, the amount of humus in a soil decides on the capability of the soil to store water. So whenever you have a drought, the more humus you have in the soil, the longer the soil can provide the plants, uh, the crops actually with water. Uh, it's also a good measurement against floods because the water stays in the soil and doesn't spill away. And like this, we can uh, actually collect CO2 by plant growth from the atmosphere, which we re-sequest into the soil. And this is the concept of green fertilizer. And if we replace artificial fertilizer with that, which is already causing emissions by being produced, you need approximately two kilo of gas to produce one kilo of artificial fertilizer. And also the nitroxygen uh, that is emitted in the moment the artificial fertilizer is applied on the field, which is 200 times more climate damaging as CO2. Also that could be prevented. So we spare emissions of not producing the artificial fertilizer and we sequest CO2 on top of that into the soil, which makes our soil more rich, uh, more, more resilient to climate crisis. And, and that's an op option that only agriculture and forestry have. And we should use that potential as much as possible to contribute as much as possible to uh, uh, CO2 neutrality. And that's uh, if we don't do that with all the means that we have, that's a lost opportunity. Let me take the next question from the audience. I think this would be a good question for Agnieszka. Uh, so Imantas asks, how will the social dimension be reconciled with capping of payments when it affects 100,000, more than 100,000 uh, of hired agri employees? So Agnieszka, does the capping of payments pose a threat to the social dimension? Thank you for the question, and this is a very important. We should uh, discuss in this discussion about the employees. It's very important because the crisis situation show uh, for us in the, uh, in the sometimes and some countries have a problem uh, with um, with uh, employees in uh, uh, agricultural sector uh, in when coronavirus um, pandemic time started. And uh, this, uh, this is uh, very important for us to give all, uh, all uh, cooperatives and all farmers uh, to people for working in the village. And this is closely connected with uh, the young generation uh, farmers. And uh, I think we should discuss about this situation because uh, all countries, uh, we show this situation. We, we saw this so uh, the situation when young people uh, thought, "No, thank you. I finished uh, to uh, to working in the farms because uh, I don't have stability. I don't have information about my future, and uh, we uh, if we didn't have the support, we will the, uh, we will decide to stop to, uh, to working in the farm." And uh, the question is, uh, Thomas, if I remember well, uh, talk about this. Uh, we need to uh, inform about the result and we need to discuss and inform uh, uh, consumer about the uh, effects of the farm to force strategy and the farm uh, to uh, reform, cap, uh, cap reform. This is very, very important because this information for new generation and especially for new generation farmers at the moment is uh, point number number one and uh, i think we have different uh, dangerous point on the table on the table at the moment the one uh, cap policy the secondly um, the new uh, agreement, uh, trade agreements, free agreement like a Mercosur countries, for example, and this is uh, maybe not dangerous, but this is the very, very uh, sensitive point of discussion and farmers and cooperatives too. And I think this type of discussion about the farmers 
uh, young farmers and the new generation uh, in the farm uh, is very, very important and we should discuss about this on the future and the cap policy too. Keith, let me get you to respond to that. Um, do you think there's any inherent contradiction between the capping of payment and the social dimension? Thanks. Um, in fact, the proposal of the European Commission uh, to cap payments uh, also contains a clause that uh, uh, allows uh, farms that have a lot of costs for employees to deduct those costs from the amount that will be capped. So uh, the the purpose is precisely to make sure that those farms that employ a lot of people and that uh, make sure that employment stays in the countryside, often in areas where employment is particularly precarious, uh, uh, that, that, that that can continue. So I don't see this, uh, this, uh, this contradiction uh, at all. This is not the, the purpose, obviously not the purpose of, uh, of the proposal of the Commission. So there, I, I think uh, we're in a we're in a good uh, we're in a good position, and and I think the, the 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 way the negotiations are now going with this topic of social conditionality, so linking payments also to respect for workers' rights, uh, I think that topic uh, really shows also uh, the commitment of, uh, of of the Commission to uh, to to make sure that that it's about farmers, but also about workers on farms. Eric, I'm going to put this next question to you, since I think you have a good big picture perspective on these things. Uh, this question comes from Lynn Fortin. Regarding imports, does the support received by EU farmers via CAP level the playing field, especially vis-a-vis -vis poor countries? What would be your response to that, Eric? So the... Um so, so the question is whether uh, the support that farm that European farmers uh, get uh, would compensate for, uh, you know, the higher production costs vis-a-vis -vis imported countries. Uh, I mean, third countries. Um, I, we don't know, actually. Um, uh, to be honest, it's. Uh, I mean, there are different issues uh, related to the way that we give uh, support to farmers. As mentioned before, uh, a lot of the money is leaking away that we give to farmers. Uh, and there are various uh, mechanisms uh, through higher land prices, through maybe even higher uh, machinery uh, prices to, to landowners. I mean, there are different ways in which Actually, the direct payments leak away, or and we don't know exactly how much that is. Uh, so it's very difficult to to um, to assess, to evaluate whether you know a direct income payment given to farmers. And I mean, several of the colleagues have discussed the fact that you know there is a mismatch between uh, the way we give those subsidies uh, uh, to a great extent, still on historical grounds where there is a there is no link with uh, with specific commodities. Uh, on which uh, farmers would compete with third countries. So, so it's a very diff difficult question to, to answer, I would say. Does anyone else have a, a thought on this question? No? Okay. I'm going to take one last question before we go to our concluding remarks. Agnieszka, this is a question for you from Anonymous Questioner. It's quite specific. I'm not sure if you can answer or not. Uh, but they ask, what is the highest percentage in eco-schemes that you would approve? <laughs> Thank you for the question. 20. <laughs> it's my dream. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that. Okay, so let's go to wrap-up questions. Um, Chris, let me start with you. What's, what are you. what's your key takeaway from today's conversation, especially keeping in mind this is an ongoing issue as we have these negotiations? Well, I, I think uh, I, I take away a lot of uh, optimism about the fact that we can reach a deal this month, one. And I take away also the uh, the reference to the need for uh, a holistic uh, approach, yeah? that it's not just about the cap, that we need to bring in all actors in the food chain to make this big step towards sustainability. I, I take away a lot of consensus on where we want to go. And, you know, now we're debating how what is the best way to get there. But but um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I take away an optimistic message. That's a positive note to end on. Thomas, what are your concluding thoughts? 
Well, first of all, it sounds good that the Commission stays optimistic. And to be to be frank, uh, well, some of the proposals that we see on the table are indeed indeed showing progress into the right direction. Uh, and especially when I when I also hear that the more general links where the the whole food system is getting more in the center, uh, also of the political debate and of the proposals, that also is something that I find encouraging. Uh, what I still what I still regret a lot uh, is that. That we we parts of the negotiations uh, and negotiators like Kopa Kojeka, uh, also Agnieszka today, who, who is she representing here, are still so much focused on the uphold of the short-term revenues, of the short-term maximum productivity in terms of outcomes, while not taking into regard the environmental and also social damages we have at the same time, and not the, the lack of readiness to include the, the environmental environmental damages and side effects uh, into the bigger picture of what is a sustainable, resilient, mid-term and long-term uh, production scheme for the European Union. And just to mention, I'm a farmer myself, so the farming community is uh, represented by different voices. And okay, my role is more to put the finger on the points where I think we're not ambitious enough, we're not using all the chances that we have uh, in agriculture to contribute, uh, and, and that I regret a little bit, but I see progress, uh, and especially also colleague Dorfman, who I, I work with in the European Parliament, representing the conservative farming sector, uh, representing a quite progressive standpoint. Also, that gives me some hopes that also in the, let's say, classical conservative agricultural field, there is a change of thought, a change of narrative, a change of how to see uh, the 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 out the the direction uh, into mid and long term security of productivity and food supply for the European Union. So uh, let's go on and talk, and we will find solutions, and we move on. Eve, what are your key takeaways from today's discussion? M maybe that I, I want to be optimistic, and uh, and as. Uh, the other speakers uh, said, I think that we, we have the chance now, in, just in a few days, of course, when it comes to the CAP, to define and to put on the table balanced and strong solution. And solutions which will take into account the diversity of local realities. Uh, honestly, negotiators, uh, quite a lot already, uh, and today we are quite sure that we will have a CAP with a C, a common electoral policy and not 27 black boxes. This is quite something. And uh, the, the second point is I, I do think that due as well to the COVID, unfortunately to the COVID crisis, everyone as in mind that food security is not an outdated issue. So now we have to deliver, and if we want to deliver, we need a CAP based on triple performance, economic, environmental, social, and all together. Uh, and this will be something very valuable to prepare the future, to prepare the transition of Europe and of the agri-food sector that we need. Uh, I mean, in a point that we should be very concrete, pragmatic, pragmatic and ambitious. Agnieszka, what are your concluding thoughts? Thank you so much. Thank you for this discussion, because all discussion is very important for our future and uh, to be a uh, close all decision. I think that this uh, very important and uh, wise decision for farmers and for agriculture and concludes this uh, this uh, this, uh, this meeting and this discussion. Uh, I uh, mm, hope uh, Every uh, will be okay and will be good for uh, for our farmers uh, and for cops, agri cops too. And the last time, uh, farmers and European far farmers uh, very very change. 
change to be a positive, change to be uh, for uh, re respect for a climate, uh, change for uh, for eco to be our green. But we need about this and we respect this situation and we want to know what happened, what type of effects will be strategy farm or for, uh, farm to farm strategy. This is a very important because the last uh, year we didn't have this document about the effect of the strategy. But uh, I'm uh, very optimistic uh, on the end in this day and I hope all uh, farmers, cooperatives and uh, MAPS, for example, European Commission the negotiation will be uh, celebrate success uh, on the end in this month. Thank you. And finally, Eric, what are your key takeaways? Well, thanks, Dave. On, on the positive side, uh, I really welcome the, the, the intention of the Commission and the Parliament particularly to work in a more systemic way. Uh, and also in a more results-based uh, way, which we didn't discuss in, in today's dialogue uh, too much. But actually, that last point is also my main concern. I, st I still see a lot of practice-based approaches rather than result-based approaches. And one of the problems, one of the, the challenges uh, still lay in making the link between practices and uh, outcomes. I, I mean... Uh, uh, Thomas in indicated the use of green fertilizers, but do we know actually how much CO2 is being sequestered in that way? Uh, you know, carbon farming, biodiversity, they, they all actually um, have the same problem in which it is so difficult to measure and monitor actual results. And also if you talk about, uh, we haven't talked about the carbon adjustment scheme as well. Here we, again, we have the same problem. It may be easy to to measure the CO2 Related to to, uh, to steel production, but in the in the in the uh, with relation to agricultural projects, that will be much more difficult. And I'm just concerned that that will delay actual actually implementing those solutions. Thanks a lot, and thanks to all of our panelists for some really interesting contributions. I think that's given us a lot of food for thought, particularly, as I mentioned, because this is an ongoing issue. Uh, so thanks so much to you guys. Thanks so much to the people at home for asking some great questions. Obviously, here at Your Active, we're going to keep covering this issue, and we're going to leave you now with a highlights video of some of the work that Your Active has been doing in covering the CAP reform. So enjoy the video, and I wish you a great afternoon. I'm Natasha Foote. And I'm Gerardo Fortuna. The subject we're going to be talking today is probably the most pressing issue when it comes to agricultural policy at the EU level. Natasha, do you reckon there's a topic more contentious, disputed, mm. controversial than common agricultural policy? Definitely controversial cap. That's, that's what it should be known as from henceforth. The EU's common agricultural policy, or cap as it's known, aims to support farmers and improve agricultural productivity, ensuring a stable supply of affordable food and that EU farmers are able to make a reasonable living while also safeguarding the environment. When the Common Agricultural Policy first saw the light of day in 1962, it was already clear that it would have had a big impact on the development of agricultural statistics in Europe, and that's because the implementation of the CAP requires statistics that were not only detailed and up-to-date, but also comparable in each member state. While it's true that agricultural spending is the largest individual part of the EU's total expenditure, this is because agricultural policy is handled by the EU directly, unlike some sectors such as transport or education, and this means that all funding for agriculture comes from the EU budget. Things are, have radically changed uh, since the presentation of the CAP proposal in, in uh, 2018 because, of course, Green Deal was unveiled and in the meantime, uh, I mean, we're, talk we're talking about a huge revolution. We need a policy that understands local needs and works for all, large and small, at all corners of the Union. And this is why we are trying to change our approach to rural development, not only in the common agricultural policy, 
but also through the European Green Deal. We cannot micromanage a whole continent from Brussels, but together we can set the direction of our common work. Our message to rural commun communities should be like this. If you choose to go green and digital, it will pay off. The Farm to Fork strategy is the EU's new flagship food policy. It aims to improve lifestyles, health and the environment, offering a comprehensive approach to food sustainability. Consumers play a key role in the fork end of the strategy and the strategy works to encourage consumers to choose a sustainable food option. I try to consume organic uh, when it's possible, but I think it's also important to look at the origin of the food because for me it doesn't matter to, to buy something organic if it comes from South America or super far away, so I prefer looking at the, the origin of the food than the, the fact that it's organic or not. Especially with the fact that, I mean, being organic is a, is a label and some product, like local products, can be kind of organic, they just don't have the label. Many consumers have changed their eating habits, spending more time at home cooking and are more interested in organic products, but also would like to see more information on the origin of their food and the fairness of their production. Food for thought for the EU policymakers, as the Commission's Farm to Fork strategy currently seems far more focused on nutritional aspects when it comes to front of pack labeling. An unexpected statement the Agriculture Commissioner Janusz Wojciechowski made before the French Senate about the targets in the Farm to Fork strategy. And for the first time, he suggested the possibility of revising the ambitious targets of the new food policy at a later stage if anything goes wrong and particularly if food security is threatened. The Environment Commissioner Virginius Sinkevicius argued the contrary, saying that food security is no longer a major concern for the EU, while other challenges are dominating the European food system, such as food waste, overconsumption, obesity and its overall environmental footprint. As one of the sectors that stands to lose the most in climate change, the question is, what can the sector do to help mitigate and adapt to this new reality? And what support is on offer for the sector to deal with these new kinds of crises? We need to prepare the agriculture sector in order that is, of course, contributing uh, to uh, mitigating the climate change, in particular when we are talking about uh, the land management but also not only the land management, which is mainly related to the production side, but also to the production of the food, uh, consumption of the food, waste management, which is also a big problem uh, when we are talking about uh, contribution to, to climate change. Of course, these kind of changes don't happen overnight. And as much as you can try to preempt crises, sometimes it's simply not possible. But what kind of support is on offer for farmers in the EU for climate crises? The crisis reserve has not been used because uh, member states do not want it. Uh, somehow there is a mechanism obliging that if you use the crisis reserve means that there is a direct cut in cut payments. So it comes at a cost to use the crisis reserve. It's not free money. And that is the reason why the Parliament and the Member States do not want to activate the crisis reserve. Until the Commission will finally unveil its final act in the, in the context of the Farm to Fork, which is this framework on sustainable food systems that the Commission has planned to deliver before 2023, this is expected to be an overarching framework, of course, that will provide a basis to ensure policy coherence at the EU and national level, also setting out general principles and requirements that will underpin the development of food legislation in food-related policies, including possible reviews of the existing acquis. The European lawmakers uh, in the European Parliament are negotiating for reaching an agreement on a common text uh, for, for the reform of the common agricultural policy. As you probably know, the, the common agricultural policy file is divided into these three pieces of legislation dealing specifically with uh, strategic plans, uh, horizontal government governance, and common market organization, the, the CMO. Of course, Culture Minister uh, Maria Doceo Antunes 
our objective is to conclude the CAP negotiations, which require a demanding timetable of discussion in order to obtain an agreement in the spring. This is the appropriate timing for implementing the CAP strategic plans in each member state from January 2023. Feel positive progress in, uh, in these outstanding issues like green architectures. It means that we are closer uh, to the end. So you have to follow religiously our updates on, uh, on uh, your active website from now Very on. <laughs> Top tip for the listeners is follow your active. Of course. I mean, it's the only way to stay up to date. It's, it's useless <laughs> if you now circle on your, on your calendar the Agrifish Council of May just because Ulrike Muller or, or the Portuguese minister expect a deal before some. Uh, so. You heard it here first, folks. Follow your active, listen to the podcast. <laughs>